Hi there, my name is Brian Coleman and I am a freelance design director, motion designer and style frame artist based out of Denver, Colorado. I work with After Effects, Redshift, Arnold, Octane and X Particles. Most importantly, I work with Cinema 4D, which is the foundation of all of my work. Generally, I focus on broadcast and commercial design work, but today I'll be discussing a new short film I made called Emergence. I work with a wide range of clients, including Apple, MPC, Future Deluxe, The Mill, Frame Store, and Man vs. Machine. I'd like to thank Maxon and Matthias for bringing me out today to discuss my workflow using Cinema 4D, Redshift, and Red Giant for After Effects. A lot of my work leans towards data visualization, but I also do a lot of photorealistic lighting, rendering, and animation. Today I'm going to be discussing how to create a bump and displacement shader graph network with multiple textures in Redshift. I'll set up projection cameras to art direct a location of our materials. I'll also create multiple cameras and lighting setups in one scene. Then I'll touch on the take system to speed up and simplify your workflow. I'll use After Effects to color grade and composite the C4D renders. And finally, I will show you how to use Magic Bullet Looks to get quick color ideas for your style frames. You can check out my work on my website, briancoleman.com, on Instagram at brian underscore the underscore coleman, on Twitter at brian the coleman, and on foundation at brian coleman. To begin, let's take a look at my demo reel. I'm going to start with my short film Emergence, which was a collaboration between myself and my buddy Nicholas Arnold, uh, otherwise known as Frame and Color. Uh, you can check out his website here. Uh, so take a look and we'll get going. All right, let's jump into Cinema 4D here. Um, I've got this uh, base human male figure. Um, the only thing I want to work with here is sort of this neck and head area. So I'll go into point mode, make sure my base is selected. Go into the front view viewport, uh, choose the lasso selection tool, and then just do sort of a rough selection around the rest of the body that we are not going to be working with. Zoom back in on the head here and let's go to our deformers and choose the melt deformer. Let's apply that to the base and right off the bat we see we, we get sort of this puddle uh, of geometry which is uh, very interesting. Let's make a couple of adjustments. So let's rotate this forward and I want to add a linear fall off to it. Now let's rotate that linear fall off around by about 90 degrees so that uh, the front of our face here is still intact and we're sort of getting this fall off for this, this melting sort of in the back of the head here. Um, let's just extend this fall off out a bit and then move it back in Z space. So I want to make sure that, that it's just affecting kind of right here behind the eyes. I, I want to make sure that I retain the integrity of sort of the forehead, the eyes, the nose, and the mouth, and probably even a little bit of the chin. 
Um, so we could see that we're getting this really interesting effect where it's sort of melting or, or deforming everything um, on the back of that fall off here. So let's just make a couple of adjustments to, to get the look that we are going for. Let's increase the strength to 100, decrease the vertical randomness to zero, the radial randomness to zero, and increase the melted size. So you start to sort of get this really funny sort of caricature piece of geo here, which I guess if you wanted to, you could keep working with like that. But for our purposes, I'm going to just zoom in here so that we only see the face. So you can see that now we have this flat plane um, and then this face is sort of emerging from that. So let's create a new camera um, from where we are currently at with our default camera. And I'm going to change this field of view to be about 30 degrees. Probably have to zoom out just a little bit. Let's make sure that our rotation is all zeroed out in our X and maybe yeah, something like that. Let's just uh, keep it like that. We can make some adjustments. So I'm going to call this projection cam one. Let's create a new redshift material, drag and drop that material onto our base and drag it onto the eyes as well. Um, let's go into a redshift render view viewer. I actually have a preset set up so that I can toggle between some of my, my uh, presets here pretty quickly. Let's click play so that we start to get an idea of um, our material getting built and how all of this is going to start to come together. One of the first things I like to do is create a redshift sun and sky rig. The default light in cinema and for redshift doesn't really give us a very good idea um, of shadows and um, give us a bit of information here that will really help us build the material. So this is just sort of a rough, quick, dirty uh, light setup that I create. Um, and then eventually I'm going to use uh, a different light setup. Uh, so we'll just work through this together. Let's double click and make sure that we get our material set up here. I actually do have this other setup I'm probably going to pop into. Um, so I have my, my render view set up here. I've got my shader graph here. So let's start to set some things up. So the first thing that I want to do is use a texture node and let's apply our So let's apply our texture. I have this um, texture here that I got from a friend of mine, Nicholas Arnold. You can find him online at Frame and Color. Uh, so let's choose that and apply that to the diffuse color. Um, so we now have this sort of paint texture being applied to the entire surface here. Um, let's make sure that we select both of our material tags and where it says projection let's change that to camera mapping and I want to drag the projection cam one into the camera so that now we are using this camera to project our uh, texture onto the surface of this face. I'd say that we could probably make a few adjustments here maybe we just zoom in a bit um, you know you could probably place the texture here a little bit uh, maybe so that we get some of that color here off to the side of the cheek, a little bit on the eye, um, and then have this nice spiral sort of coming off the right here. Um, so that's looking pretty good. I might just make a quick adjustment as well to the lighting. Um, I feel like it's sort of just directly overhead and maybe just make a couple of quick adjustments. Um, again, this is just all temporary. You don't have to go too deep, too deep into it, but um, I think it just helps to give it a bit of reality right off the bat. The next thing I'd like to do is just go into my render settings, make sure that we have Redshift selected, go into the Redshift tab under GI, select uh, Brute Force, 
for the primary GI engine and then brute force again for the secondary GI engine. Uh, we can leave some of these settings right now. It's all sort of a little generic, but um, we can make some changes as we need to. The next thing I'd like to set up is a bit more of a bump map in here. So let's create a ramp texture and then let's create a bump node and apply our original texture to the ramp and then apply the ramp to the bump and then we can apply that bump map node to our bump input of the material and just for the sake of being able to see it better let's crank that up to 8 so we could see right now that our original texture is driving the bump map so anywhere that's a lighter color or white gives us the uh, texture the the geometry coming forward and anywhere that's a little bit darker nothing's really happening I can show you what that really looks like here by plugging my ramp into the diffuse color for the material um, so this is all it, it looks pretty good one of the reasons that I like to attach a ramp to it is that it allows me to desaturate the color very quickly and then I can make some adjustments on the texture um, on the fly just to maybe crush it down a little bit so that we only get bump map here where the white is or um, you know I could also make the whole thing be a bit more of a bump map but uh, in general I just like to have a bit more control over my bump map and color by using these ramp nodes and I'll use those quite a bit more too. Let's apply the color back to the diffuse color of the material and then take a look at the final output image to show you how I set up some of the other textures. Alright, so jumping over here to After Effects, uh, we can see this is our final rendered image. Um, so we have our color texture here. Uh, we have the, kind of the bump going on. But one thing that you don't see in the other cinema file that I'm working on is that we have all this texture that's up here. So let's go back into Cinema and start to set some of that up. All right, jumping back into Cinema here. Um, the next thing I want to do is create a new texture node. And I'm going to choose this Metal Scratch texture. And I want to apply that directly to the diffuse color so you can see what's going on. So this Metal Scratch texture sort of gave me the idea that, you know, this felt kind of close to skin you know so it's it's somewhat somewhat abstract but some of these long lines up here uh, when you use them on the bump map kind of gave the appearance of skin um, versus using an actual skin texture I just thought that this was a nice uh, approach and maybe a little bit different than what was expected so let's uh, let's scale this so that we have more repetitions here and you can see that I'm not really working with a seamless texture on this, which is actually fine because it's not really the main thing that's driving it. So one thing that I will do is use the mirror U and the mirror V. And you can see that it starts to make it feel seamless. It's not really seamless, um, but it just sort of covers up some, some of the areas that we really are looking to add some detail to. So. Uh, the next thing I want to do is combine my original color texture, that ink, and this new metal scratch texture. So I'll do that by creating a new color composite node, which will then allow me to combine these two colors together. I'd like to create a new ramp node as well, and then I apply my metal texture to the ramp, and then let's drag that ramp into the blend color. Uh, just for the sake of quick and dirty right now, let's uh, plug the ramp into the diffuse color. And then again, right now we have this very almost grayscale texture of, over the entire surface. So I might just crush the levels a little bit on this uh, just to break that up. So we can see that we're starting to get a bit more on the fly with this ramp node which again I really like to use because you can just crush the levels really quickly um, and 
Yeah, it's probably feeling pretty good. Uh, the other thing that I, I want to point out on this specifically is that I'm not getting a lot of color or um, my metal texture up here on the forehead, and that's sort of the primary area that I want it to be. So let's just go into my texture node and under remap uh, where it says offset, let's just make a couple of quick adjustments in here and, and just sort of apply that texture a bit more to the forehead. Um, so that seems to be working. Now let's plug in the ramp from our original color into the base color. And then let's take this color composite and let's put that into the diffuse color just so we can see what's going on. So again, this is the black and white version of our original color. And we can see that by uh, going over here to the composite mode, it says base color. If I change that to blend color, we now see the metal texture only. Um, a lot of times you might just want to average those two together so it combines the original color texture with the new metal texture that we added to it. Uh, but you'll sort of notice that our original texture gets a little bit grayed out um, and it all becomes, basically it's meeting in the middle of both textures. So I found for this specific purpose that I use the exclusion. So we are very bright on the white on the face and then we still retain a lot of that brightness on the metal texture as well. So now let's take the color composite node plug that into the bump map and then let's reapply our diffuse color node and I'm going to just use my region selector here just so that we can see exactly what's going on but it starts to now that we added all this detail it's really breaking up the light quite a bit so you can see we're starting to get some of this uh, these horizontal lines over here which is starting to look like skin. I have my settings set pretty low right now so we're not going to get the best render out of it but um, let's jump back over into After Effects and I can show you exactly what it's doing. Okay back in here in After Effects um, I'll just zoom in here on the forehead since that's the area that I was kind of looking at the most. You can see that we have these horizontal lines and some of these scratches in here which are creating sort of that skin texture that I was describing. The other thing that we can see on here is I have uh, this other bump texture or noise that's adding another layer to the depth that we're getting here on the surface of the skin. So let's jump back into After Effects and continue building that material. All right, back here in Cinema, let's create a new texture node. And then let's create a C4D shader node as well. For the C4D shader, uh, let's go into the parameters and let's type in 1024 by 1024. And under the depth, let's choose 16 bits. So we do that because it gives any information that we plug in to here, more resolution for Redshift to give us a better and higher quality render when we're done with it. Under shader, let's choose noise and I'll just click on the little icon right here which is gonna bring up my shader noise in the attributes panel. Um, you could choose noise, um, the default if you like. Uh, you could choose any of these. I've actually worked with a lot of these uh, noise variations here. Um, for this purpose I want to use blistered turbulence. Under octaves, let's crank that up to 10. It's going to give us a bit more detail. Um, under the global scale, let's make that 50% and then let's plug that C4D shader into the texture node. In order to use the C4D shader you have to plug it into a texture node in order for it to be seen. Let's plug that new texture node into the diffuse color so that we have an opportunity to see exactly what's going on. So we now have this noise that's projected onto the surface here. Um, so that's looking okay. One other thing I should probably do is create a new ramp node and then plug in my texture into the ramp. And again, I do this because it just gives me a really fast way to crush the levels down. Plug the ramp into the diffuse color. 
and maybe crush this down a little bit so that we have some more contrast in here. That's probably good for now. Um, one of the reasons that I like to use the ramp on a noise shader here, you could just go into the noise and adjust the contrast, adjust the brightness, any of the settings in here, but for me personally, again, it's just a personal preference. I like to use the ramp because it helps me work a little bit faster, in my opinion. Let's plug the diffuse color back in the normal one, I guess. And then uh, what I want to do now is combine my original color texture, my new metal texture, and my new noise texture. I want to put them all together, and then that will be our bump input here. Let's create another color composite node. And let's use our metal texture as the base color and use our new noise node as the blend color then plug that into the diffuse color again just so we can sort of get an opportunity to see what we're creating here um, there's our metal texture and the blend color is the noise um, i'll probably just choose average on this um, maybe even i don't know what let's just play around with this a bit maybe multiply, add. Add makes it very bright, so anywhere that's really white right here is gonna give us a lot of bump. Um, let's just see it like that for now, see what happens. Um, so let's take this, very, uh, this brand new color composite node that we created and apply it to the blend color, which the metal texture was originally in that blend color, but now we have the metal texture and the noise combined together uh, in the blend color. Let's plug our real color back in there and then uh, let's zoom in here just uh, so that we have an opportunity to see this forehead a bit more maybe uh, let me take this down a little bit maybe it's just roughening things up too much let's also just turn our reflection roughness up a bit just so that we can Maybe get rid of some of these really intense uh, reflections and fireflies that we're getting in there. So it's starting to create a really cool texture. So again, you sort of have this uh, uh, metal texture across the surface here. Um, you could even potentially just, you know, maybe tone it down a touch by going into the ramp that is connected to that metal and uh, choose the white color here on the far right and then just drag this over maybe make it a little bit maybe make it a little more gray so you can see again that just very quickly with this ramp I can tone down those lines on that metal texture and now we can see the noise coming through um, maybe for that noise I can just make an adjustment to the ramp here and uh, maybe instead of it being so dark you can just kind of bump that up a bit but you can really play with these settings endlessly and I have um, but this should give you a pretty good foundation to make this project your own let's jump back into After Effects and go into a bit more detail here alright back in After Effects let's take a look at the final rendering that we created so we have this noise texture we've got the metal texture all combined in here to create this bump map. Um, the other thing I want to start to work on now is some of the displacement. So we could see that the bump map created some really interesting variation on the texture, but to really send this thing home, we got to use displacement maps to bring out some of that detail of our original texture, which you can see these really pretty lines coming through here up on the forehead across the nose and uh, some of the detail down here. So let's continue to set up our material in Cinema. So I've got my shader network set up here, which is definitely starting to get a little bit out of control. And I was messing around with this and realized, and some of you might already know, that you can go into tools in your Redshift shader graph and under the layout graph, if you click that, it organizes all of your nodes for you 
which I feel like took me a little too long to discover, but now everything is nice and organized and laid out and much easier to work with. The next thing I'd like to do, create a ramp node and let's also add a displacement node as well. This is our original texture, our original color. So let's plug that into the ramp. And then let's plug that ramp into the displacement in the texture map. And then plug that displacement into the displacement of our material output. We don't see anything change off the bat, and that's because we have to make a few adjustments to our geometry. So with the eyes selected, let's hit Shift C, which brings up my command dialog box, and I know I want to add a redshift object tag to it. And I'll duplicate that by, on a PC, grabbing Control and dragging it down on a Mac, I believe that it's command. Let's select both of those texture tags and under geometry, let's click override. Under tessellation, let's click enable. Under displacement, let's enable that and turn on the maximum displacement here. Let's crank that up to about 35 and then the displacement scale will be eight. I chose those numbers simply because I'd worked with it quite a bit and found that those numbers worked for my specific uh, project here. If we go back up here to the edge length and then the maximum subdivisions, I just like to think of, of these as um, if we added a subdivision surface to any of our geometry, it, it adjusts it on the fly. And then that's the same thing that the Redshift object geometry tag will do here, is it will subdivide our geometry in the tag as opposed to doing it directly within the scene. So it's very helpful, helps, uh, helps the scene go by a little bit faster, work a little bit faster in that scene. So now that we added our displacement to the scene, uh, we can see that we have quite a bit more detail here. If I just turn off the displacement, you can see that everything is a little bit more smooth. We still have some bump map stuff going on in there, but the displacement map is really what makes it look so good. Let's cinema kind of figure this out. And that's looking pretty good. Um, one thing that I did discover while working with this scene is that, um, you know, typically where we want the areas to come forward is, is white. Um, I have a lot of detail here in this texture, so we're getting a lot of information on the white, which is cool, and you might leave it like this, but I actually found that it looked a little bit more interesting when I used these dark areas to come forward and then the white areas to not really be that prevalent. So let's go into our ramp node here that we are working with that is applied to the original color. And you could do this a couple of ways. Um, basically, I'm going to invert this ramp by choosing the white color on the right and making it black, and then the black color on the left and make it white. And I'll just quickly disconnect the displacement again just because it is a bit taxing on the computer and for sake of time I just want to get through a few things with you guys. If I plug that ramp into the diffuse color we can see now that any area that was white is now black and any area that was a bit darker is now going to be pretty bright white. So let's go back into our ramp and again just make a couple of quick adjustments here. If I just drag this black color down, we can see that now we're getting a bit more contrast um, in any area that's black, really nothing's gonna happen. Um, let's just see how that looks. Plug our color back into the diffuse and then plug our displacement back in as well. And let's take a look at some of the results that we're gonna get here. Give Cinema an opportunity to start to render this out. And we see here that, uh, 
I guess this is just a personal preference, but any area that's dark here starts to come forward. And I think that looks a little bit better than some of these areas that were white. I feel like it just gives it a, maybe a bit more detail. Um, I'm not sure what it is, but again, it's all, it's all personal preference. Um, so the next thing I'd like to do is just set up a bit of lighting. I'm going to disconnect the displacement again, and then let's take a look at uh, After Effects and our final render here just to see what I'm about to do. I want to take a look at the lighting here. So we have this light source that is sort of coming from up above here. And then we have another light source that's off to the right. So let's jump into Cinema and I'll show you how I set that up. Uh, let's create a new redshift area light. And I'm going to turn off my redshift sky. And then let's go into my right viewport here and let's choose perspective as opposed to the right view there. Let's go into hidden lines and then let's just zoom out a little bit, give us an opportunity to see the entire space. So with that area light selected, I want to go to cameras, use camera, set active object as camera. And then we can use that light now as a camera to then place it a little bit better on the surface here. Um, on the fly, I guess you could say. So again, we have this light source that's sort of coming from up here, uh, creating some really nice shadows across the surface over here. Um, seems like that placement's probably pretty good. The other thing that I want to do is create an actual camera because at this exact moment, I am looking through the projection cam at this face, but I want to create a new camera um, so you could do that a couple ways. You could probably just duplicate this or create, click a new camera here. Either way is fine. And I'll call this one cam one. Make sure that we are using that in our viewport over here. And then let's place a protection tag on that prote projection cam one so that we don't inadvertently move our texture around because the placement on it's pretty good right now. I do realize that one thing I'd like to do is make an adjustment to this texture because it is currently getting squished and that is happening because under the default here the film aspect is set to standard 4 to 3 but the original image that I used was 16.9 so if I just adjust that pretty quickly there we can see that it compresses it down um, maybe I'll just make a quick adjustment now that I've that now that I know that that's uh, happening, make sure that I have my projection cam one here selected and you know, zoom out a bit so that it gets a bit more coverage on that face. So that seems pretty good. And then let's click back on our cam one to make sure that we sort of zoom back in here. Um, and that's starting to feel pretty good. The other thing I want to do on this shot is take the field of view down to about 20 degrees. So it's going to flatten everything out a bit, but it seems to me that it, it just feels a little bit better, I guess, for me when things are flattened out a bit. If I was using um, a larger field of view, the nose and maybe even the mouth here come forward so much that it just distorted the image more than I really wanted to. It's a personal preference. Um, if you wanted to do something a little bit different, feel free. Um, but again, I'm just kind of showing you how I, how I work on this stuff. Um, so that's feeling pretty good. So I, I might put the protection tag here on uh, cam one, two, and just make sure that we lock that in place. Let's make some adjustments now to our light. So Right now I'm still looking through that light, so make sure that you go back to the default camera here and then uh, zoom out. I also want to turn off the work plane here so you don't see it. So a light is pretty small, um, so one thing that I want to do is maybe let's just uh, make it a little bit longer. Um, could also just maybe zoom in a little bit just so that area is a little bit more, or the light's a little bit more focused maybe down here. Um, Let's go into the area light and make a couple of changes. Under the color, 
I want to make this a little bit of a bluer tone. It's very light, very subtle, uh, and it sort of brings out some of those purples that are in the original texture that we used. I also want to turn down the intensity to maybe 20. Um, and then underneath the spread here, the spread basically spreads that light out to be soft or quite harsh. Um, so if you have it all the way out, it's very, very soft. It creates very soft shadows, um, which are pretty good. I might just tone it down a touch just so that it doesn't spread so far out and that light is focused in here a little bit. It also makes the shadows just a little bit tighter. Uh, then let's just crank this down so it's not so blown out. So that's looking pretty good. It's starting to look very illustrative or mystical even, I guess you could say. So that looks really good. The other thing I wanna do then is add that light to the other side here. So let's just call this light one and then duplicate that by selecting it, control dragging down. And then I'll call this one light two. And let's go in back into my perspective viewport under use camera, set active object as camera. And then let's just move over here to the other side of the face. And I'm going to make this one a bit of a warmer tone. Um, just to give the light a little bit variation here. So let's click OK. You can see that now we have um, a little bit warmer light on this side, a little bit cooler light on that side. So that's actually looking pretty good. Um, let's click uh, back here into our shader graph and under this placement, let's connect that again. And it'll give us an opportunity to really see what our lighting has done to the scene and also the displacement to see how that's working together. I'm going to zoom in here a little bit and that's starting to look really, really good. Um, we have some highlights here on this brow. Uh, we have highlights here across the nose. Um, I'd say all in, this is probably pretty solid. So we've got our Cam 1 set up working. Got the textures all working really well, the lighting set up. Um, but I have another shot that I used this scene for so let's jump into After Effects and take a look at that. So if I just scrub here through the, the movie or the QuickTime here in After Effects, we can see this other shot where we're actually really close to the lips. So this uses a different camera and a different light setup and a different texture, but I'm going to show you how to set all of that up very quickly in the same scene. All right, back here in Cinema, Let's do uh, a couple of uh, things to manage the scene a bit more. So let's select both of our lights and on a PC I'll select Alt G and call this Light Cam Cam 1 and I am going to duplicate that and I will call that Light Cam 2. Let's go into the Layers panel here and double click to create a new layer. I'll double click on the name and let's call that Lights Cam 1. I'm going to have it selected, control drag it to the Lights Cam 1 group and then let's just duplicate that and call a new layer Lights Cam 2 then control drag that onto the Lights Cam 2 group. Let's turn off Lights Cam 1, so now we are not seeing it, nor is it being rendered, and only our Lights 2 group here is working. So let's create a new camera. Let's go back into my perspective view, which is looking through Cam 1, and I will duplicate that and call that one Cam 2. Make sure that we are using that to render through or to look through and take that protect protection tag off there and then we can zoom in here to these lips of the face and maybe just set this up something like that um, i want to come down here to my material and i'm going to duplicate that material but let's call this cam one material 
and let's call it, let's duplicate that by control dragging, pulling that over and call this cam2 material and go into the eyes and the base, select both of these texture tags and then pull our new material in under material. Let's just drag and drop that on there. So now we have our new cam2 material attached to the eyes into the base here. Let's make sure that we uh, turn off the displacement here because again, it just helps to work a little bit faster in the scene. Um, we don't really need it right now anyway because we're going to set up our camera and set up a new light system. So back into the camera view here, let's uh, just make some adjustments here so that we're sort of getting this nice close up view of these lips. Um, one thing I kind of want to do with this is make sure that we sort of see the edge of the lips to help define it a bit. Otherwise you just sort of see a little bit too much in the background. So I'd say that that works pretty well. Um, right now our light setup is not really made for this view, nor is our texture. So let's address that right now. Let's go back into our perspective view and Let's choose the default camera just so that we can kind of see our scene and what's going on here. Um, under the light too, let's just turn that off in our objects view here and now we're only looking at the lights one which that's actually pretty good but let's really define it a little bit more. So I'll go to use camera, set active, active object as camera and we can see that our light is really focused kind of on this nose area or the cheek. And I want to just maybe manipulate that a little bit just so that it's kind of touching the edge of the lips here just to kind of create this really nice highlight along the edges there and getting some really nice soft shadows off to the right. It's definitely really bright right now. So let's turn the intensity of that light down. Let's just say maybe to like two um, and maybe bring that over just to touch. It's probably looking pretty good. So now we have sort of this highlight here and the next thing we want to do is create a bit more of a flood. So let's turn on our light too and then let's use that as our camera and zoom in here just so that we can place it in the scene a bit more and I don't really want this light to be too bright. I just want it to be a bit of a flood light. So let's turn the intensity down quite a bit, maybe maybe two, something like that right now. So that that's, seems to be pretty good. So let's work through the material um, to make sure that our lighting is good. But we want to make sure that that texture is set up mostly in this area. So we'll do that by creating a new projection camera and we'll call this projection cam two. Let's remove the protection tag on there. And then with that selected, let's go into camera, set active object as camera, and then let's zoom in. And I can actually change the display here to be quick shading just to give us an idea of, you know, where I'm actually placing that um, texture at. Uh, let's highlight the two, uh, the material or the cam two material. Uh, let's highlight both of those tags. And we're still using the projection cam one, so I can use my selector here and just make sure that we use projection cam two. Um, another thing that I'd like to do is just double click on the material tag and under editor, it's using the default texture preview size. Let's just make that 1024 by 1024. So in the viewport, it becomes a bit more clear. Um, so we're still in our projection cam too, so I can actually just kind of zoom in and uh, maybe just place this a little bit more carefully, though this actually does look really good already. Um, maybe even make, make it back where it was. I'll zoom out just a little bit so we get a bit more coverage. So again, the goal is just to get a bit of that texture kind of across the surface here so we we have some darks and, and our texture is now centered around these lips, which that's all looking pretty good. Um, let's just turn our displacement back on just to see what that actually looks like. Give my two graphics cards a few minutes to catch up, do a little bit more work for us. 
There we go. So that, that looks okay. It maybe is just a little too intense. So let's just turn the displacement down to say maybe 0 0.5 just so it's not quite so intense. So I'd say all in that probably looks pretty good right now. Um, you can make some more adjustments to it, especially if you follow me along on your own. The next thing that I want to show you though is how to set up and use the take system to render and use multiple cameras with multiple materials. So I use the take system because you run into these situations where maybe you have one scene and you have um, multiple camera setups. Maybe you use a couple of different materials, but you don't really need to create a variety of projects. You can just use one project and then use the take system so to set up cameras, lights, layers. Um, it's so powerful and I'm just going to touch the surface of it just to show you how I work. So let's go into the take system and right now we can see that we have uh, one take which is the main take right here. Um, so the main take basically takes the scene as it is and that is the main take. So you can make adjustments to the main take that um, can then be used in other takes and you can record it. So let's dig into that a little bit just so I can show you. So right now we are currently using my Cam 2 with the Cam 2 lights and then the Cam 2 material. So let's double click to create a new take and I am going to call that Cam 2 take. So again, by default, because I've already got everything set up in my main take, as long as I don't make any changes, Cam 2 is currently going to replicate what I already have set up. Underneath this camera right here, let's choose Cam 2. And then we have this other icon here, which is for the render settings. And I want to set up some render settings so you have an opportunity to see the power. So let's set up a new render setting and call this uh, Cam 2 Render. And then I'll duplicate this and let's just call this Cam 1 Render. With Cam 2 Render selected, we'll go to Save and I'm just going to type in Cam 2 Image. And then with the Cam 1 Render setting chosen under Save, let's say Cam 1 Image. So back to the take window here. I have cam2 take, so I'm using my cam2. And then under render settings, let's choose cam2 render. Let's create a new take by double clicking in that panel and choose cam1 take. So for the cam1 take, let's choose the camera that we want to use. So we want to use the camera one and then we're also going to select our cam1 render so if you notice here in my render view that when i chose the cam1 take and i chose cam1 that it now is using the camera one as my render camera so with this cam1 selected let's record a couple of changes that we want to make so this icon right here auto take is going to record any changes that we make to the scene and then those will get baked into this take so let's click that so now it's recording any changes that I make so if we go back into my object panel here and I currently have my cam 2 material on here but let's drag and drop my cam 1 material on there and then let's make sure that we use the projection cam 1 on that cam one material. And then let's make sure that I don't have my displacement turned on because again, it does become very intense for the scene to render that out. Um, so I currently have the cam one material on the object. I'm using my cam one camera. And then if we go into the layers, let's turn on the visibility and the rendering of my cam one lights and then turn off the cam two lights. So now we are using everything that I had set up for that camera one. Let's go back into the take panel here 
and let's toggle off the auto take. So if you look under here under the category off to the right, we can see all the changes that got recorded. I'll expand this out just so we can see it a little bit better. So under the materials here, you can see that I changed the tag material from um, CAM 2. Now it's showing that we're going to be using the CAM 1 here on that material. And then on the layers uh, where it says false, that basically shows that I turned off the visibility and the render view for the CAM 2 lights. And then it turned on the CAM 1 editor and render view. So that's true. So that's all turned on now. So I'm not recording anything anymore. I've got my CAM 1 take selected. And if I just choose CAM 2, instantly it goes back to that CAM 2 setup that we had done with our lights, our camera, our texture. So now everything is in place. The next thing that I want to make sure I do is make sure that's selected. Okay. With CAM2, CAM2 take selected, let's go into the render settings and add to render queue. So it's going to ask me if I want to save it, and I will say yes. And I'll delete the two things that are in there. So it brought in my, my project that we've been working on here. Um, so it's called Working 3. If we come down here to take, it's showing that we are using the CAM2 take. And then for the render settings, uh, it's using the CAM2 render settings, and then under camera, it's also using our camera too. For the output file, it is using our CAM2 image. So all of this was set up, as you saw, and as long, and that is all baked into this one take. So now let's make sure that I choose my CAM1 take here, make sure that it's highlighted, and let's add this one to the render queue, and it will ask if you want to save it again. Say yes. And now you can see that for the take, it's using the CAM1 take. For the render settings, it's using the CAM1 render. All of these things are automatically set up. So you could set up three, four, five, six cameras with different materials, different lights, all using the exact same geo. Sometimes I use the setup for style frames because it gets, um, gets things done really quickly. You don't have to save a bunch of frames. Um, I worked on another project recently where I used the same scene, the same animation, and all I had to do was change the color, the camera, the lighting. So I used the take system, and I did that seven times, and then was able to send that to Deadline, which if you work with Deadline, super powerful and also allows you to use the take system. So that's definitely another plus. So now that we have our images in the render queue, we can click Render and then take those into After Effects and start to color grade them and composite everything together. So if I just sort of gently scrub through here a little bit, you can see that um, I've really color graded a lot of what's in the middle here. Um, and then I have some of this fall off here, just sort of a design idea or, or you know, just something that's a bit more interesting is that we have this color here in the middle with, with um, sort of this, you know, desaturated area on the outside. So let's just take a look at how I do a bit of my grading. So here's the final rendered image. Um, it's maybe a bit muted. Um, you know, it's pretty colorized, but I think we can bump a lot of this stuff up. So um, a lot of times I like to just maybe not work on the original image that I created and create a new uh, adjustment layer. So on a PC, just hit Control Alt Y, and that creates a new adjustment layer, or you can go up to Layer, New Adjustment Layer. And the first thing I want to do is add a levels to it. And let's, uh, let's kind of bump up the whites here a little bit just to get some, some more brightness here in these whites. And then maybe overall, I'll just brighten the entire image up, probably a little too much. And then let's just bring the blacks back down so that we're really focused here in this middle area. So that starts to feel pretty good. Another thing I, I want to start to play around with is some of the color balance. Um, so this is all sort of personal preference, but um, you know, we have, we, this whole image maybe feels a little bit cold and you could probably address that in some of the lighting. Um, but I'm going to turn up some of the shadow, the red shadow balance here, just to make this area in here a little bit more red. And um, you know, you could probably turn the, the greens down a little bit 
maybe maybe just a touch and maybe mess with the blues a bit so any uh, any of the dark blue areas maybe uh, maybe crank that up just a touch um, and then on the highlights here let's maybe pump that up a little bit so now we have kind of this nice area which is a bit more red or or warmer in the middle um, we're still getting the blue light in there which again I like um, and then the areas on the outside here that are darker maybe just a little bit cooler um, the next thing I could probably do is just add a bit of a curves here to it um, you know maybe just get a little bit more brightness here in this middle area and then any area that's dark just kind of bring that down a little bit make sure that you're on your RGB so now we're getting this you know, really nice fall off of, of color um, and darkness and then some of this area in here um, again is a bit more colorful and then to desaturate some of those red areas uh, let's actually bring that back on top of the curves under the channel control let's go into the blues and then under the hue saturation let's just turn that down so you start to get this really cool fall off of this desaturated color and then in here you see some of the purples magentas and reds are still fully saturated um, and then I like to use selective color on this as well and we can go into the uh, magentas and maybe I start to you know maybe you want to bring some of that blue back you know maybe you don't want the magentas to be quite so purple maybe you maybe you want to uh, just play around and just kind of see where some of this stuff ends up and you know when I'm desaturating some stuff it it maybe makes it a bit more monotone so selective color gives you so much power to bring some of that color back in and again all personal preference it's up to you what you really want to do here um, maybe let's, uh, let's go into the reds and bring maybe punch that up a bit So again, it's all really a personal preference. Um, you know, you can play around with this stuff endlessly, which I have done. Um, these are some things that I just knew to use on here, but one other option that I will show you that I do like to do for really quick adjustments is to use Magic Bullet Looks. Um, because sometimes I feel like I don't really know where I want to go with my color grading and Magic Bullet Looks does such a good job of giving you a really quick opportunity to make some adjustments on the fly maybe just do some really quick co color grading and um, maybe give you a really nice foundation to kind of work with so I just go in here and you know maybe look at all these different settings in here and again just Give you a really cool opportunity. This one's really cool, actually. I like that black and white quite a bit. Um, so this just gives you an opportunity to to play around with color, and you know, if you're working on some style frames and you got to send those out to a client, um, you know, it's a really good opportunity for you to have an image, um, bring it in here, and just start to play around with the looks and. Maybe you want it super punchy or maybe you want it backed off a little bit. Uh, looks does such a good job of giving you many looks really, really quickly. And hopefully you find that that could be useful for you and your workflow just like it is for me. So once again, here is the final animation. Okay, just to finish up here, I showed you how to create a bump and displacement shader graph network with multiple textures and redshift. I set up projection cameras to art direct a location of our materials. I also created multiple camera and lighting setups in one scene. Then I touched on using the take system to speed up and simplify the workflow. 
Use, I used After Effects to color grade and composite the C4D renders. And finally, I showed you how to use Magic Bullet Looks to get quick color ideas for your style frames. Once again, my name is Brian Coleman. I am a motion design director. You can check me out at briancoleman.com, on Instagram at Brian the Coleman, and on Twitter at Brian the Coleman. I really appreciate your time today. I hope that you have walked away with a better understanding of how I use cinema and maybe it'll help you in the future. Thanks so much.